Um, again, a good day. Um, um, on behalf of uh, the Fields Institute and uh, its director, Professor Kumamuti, who is on a provincial meeting today, um, I really uh, we welcome all of you to come to this uh, special uh, session of the COVID-19 seminar at the Fields Institute. And uh, we are very pleased to present uh, Peter, Professor uh, Klemek from uh, Vienna, from Austria. Uh, Peter is a professor from the uh, Medical University of Vienna and uh, a member of the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. It's a, it's a very prominent hub. Um, that I happen to know. And uh, Peter today is going to share with us if the work in uh, relevant is COVID-19 modeling. So Peter, maybe you can share screen. So you should see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so uh, hello from my side and thanks again for the, uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about our work. Um, yes, so what, what I'm going to do in this, in this talk is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, put a couple of spotlights of some of the COVID-related work that we've been doing, which is taking place on, on, on uh, yeah, multiple levels. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be rather short on the detail and rather try to show you how we approached the things. But, but please, if you um, yeah, want to um, know more about the technical details, most of the, almost all of the stuff that I'm talking about has been has been published to simply ask me uh, yeah, start asking me around after after the talk okay so what I'm, uh, am I going to tell you so just some introductory words so in in peace times a long time ago before this whole um, COVID situation started what we actually mostly focused on in my group was to develop uh, models to predict future demand in healthcare services so we're trying to predict how many diseases, uh, how many diagnoses of a certain type will occur in, in, in specific regions in Austria and which kind of, of healthcare capacities do we need in order to provide this, this, this people with, with an adequate, um, uh, adequate level of care. So originally we, most of us have been yeah, coming from, from physics and math, but we, but we have um, uh, yeah, now for a couple of, of years been, been working in this uh, healthcare capacity planning from a, from a quantitative side. So then this COVID crisis uh, erupted and changed a lot of how we, how we work because basically we are now one of the three research institutes that provides the, the Austrian government with short-term forecasts for case numbers and ICU bed occupancy. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, about the work that we are doing here and how this has impacted Austrian policies in in, in how to navigate the crisis in, in good and not so good for, uh, ways maybe. Uh, but I also want to give you an overview of our more academic activities and where we in particular have been very active in trying to quantify the impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And we are also doing some, uh, yeah, um, trying to, to de design test strategy for specific settings, particularly for schools and nursing homes in, in, in Austria that was uh, partly these test strategies have already have also been implemented in, in, in Austria. So this has been really more about, uh, yeah, also more uh, practically applied work, so to say. Good. So let me start from the, on the, on the largest scale and then move step by step to more specific settings. So uh, when this whole thing started in, in uh, March again, then we, yeah, very briefly, th uh, very quickly thought that um, in order to be able to to um, do do meaningful models of how this pandemic unfolds, the key is to have um, good, reliable data on which kind of non-pharmaceutical interventions the countries apply. So, um, the um, since particularly at the beginning there was not much data around on that, we started to build a data set by ourselves, um, particularly my colleague Amelie de Valerie, an epidemiologist was leading this activity and they have compiled a measure database uh, where they basically collect for, um, for 79 countries. Um, in a, they developed a hierarchical coding scheme for uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions and, and categorized which country took which action when. Uh, most of the 
uh, results that I'm, I'm going to show you now in this part is derived from this data. Um, and the, the exciting thing about these data sets is that uh, what, what, we, what was the thought behind this is to be able to tell so how effective are these non-pharmaceutical interventions really and, and how would the pandemic unfold if you would use different combinations of measures. So just one more sentence to the data set itself. This has meanwhile been merged with a couple of other government tractors and is now an initiative by, by, the, by the World Health Organization that collects this data. And there are really a lot of activities going on in making this, this government intervention tracker available for the scientific community. Okay, so um, the, the, in, the, in the first work that I'm, I'm, show you, I'm gonna show you, uh, we try to answer the questions, how can we measure the effectiveness of individual measures being taken and particularly in the first work, um, uh, in the first wave. I mean, as you all are aware until, um, so, okay, so the first sentence is not up to date anymore. Now we are having vaccines and we're starting to getting antiviral medications, but of course in this first wave, this, this non-pharmaceutical interventions were the only option we had to moderate the virus spread. And what we had particularly in the first wave was that, that um, the so-called hammer phase, the most governments implementing um, bundles of highly restricted measures without really knowing if they would work or not. There was also simply no information available to do that. And uh, even worse, um, they, they implemented these measures simultaneously at the same time, which makes it very hard to delineate the effects of these individual measures because um, of course the, you immediately get a multicollinearity issue. Um, I focus here on the results of our track, but, but actually we, uh, we analyzed in this work three different databases um, which combine about 50,000 implementations of, of interventions in about 200 countries. And um, we did this for validation purposes to see to which extent findings from one of these data sets transpire, also the findings from, from, from other data sets. And this is also very important in interpreting the results. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is based on the first wave, March, April 2020. And of course, things could look uh, uh, looking a bit different if we would do the same exercise now. So the idea is that we're trying to use this to correlate these NPIs across different countries with the time dependent effective reproduction number. As I told you, the, the, the challenge is that, um, yeah, this, how the measures have been implemented is, uh, this is, they have not been taken in, there were no, no, randomized, uh, no randomized controlled experiments. Basically you need to disentangle this from the data and it is not clear what is a good way of doing that. Uh, so without going too much into the detail, what the approach that we took in, in, in this work is to try to use four different methods and try to build a consensus across these different methods. First method is a, a time series regression model where we use less regularization in order to um, yeah, find out the, the sets of NPIs that explains the observed um, time curves of the uh, epidemiological curves of the epidemics best. Uh, we also used a regression model where we had a case control design. So basically for each measure, we constructed a set of countries to, that implemented this measure at a specific phase in the pandemic, countries that didn't implement uh, these measures and made a matched comparison between those two. And then we also used two more machine learning models. One is uh, simply a random forest uh, classifier uh, or predictor. And, and the other one was a deep learning model. And there we took a transformer architecture. So if you uh, want to know more about how exactly this model is specified, um, uh, you can look at the, at, the, um, at the publication. So the important point is that we have here now multiple levels of validation in work, uh, at work. First is that of course, we try to do the validation as good as possible within each single model. So cross validation, leave one out analysis and so forth. The second thing is that we can compare then the results of these four different models um, across the different methods. And finally, as I said before, we can compare the results of these four different models across three different databases of, of, of um, individually working teams that, that collected these, these trackers. Okay, so um, to give you a little bit more um, um, insights in how this data looks like. So here is uh, basically um, a visualization of how from a 
of, of how the, the data that you use for the predictions here uh, looks like. So each circle here is, an, is a, is a non-pharmaceutical intervention. We use here an intermediate a resolution level where we have about, about 60 interventions in total. Um, we arrange them here according to time. Time is measured according uh, relative to the day, which was the first day where a country experienced 30 cases. So meaning that this was uh, here, we are at the time point where uh, 25 days before uh, 30 cases have been first detected in that country. What you see is then that um, countries progress from bottom to uh, top. So we put the, the time is the, where we put the measure is uh, the average time across the countries where this was first implemented. And we connect two measures if, if one country first implemented that measure and then went on to another measure. And what you see is that uh, you have a very typical progression of, of how countries moved from less stringent to more stringent measure. Measures. So the first thing that happened is that they made border health checks, the um, quarantine policies were instated, case notification was made mandatory, then the tracing and tracking um, activities started in parallel to that, they, they um, caught the citizens back, activated emergency responses, travel alerts, then came border restrictions. And here in this phase, so this is really the, the hammer phase, where you see that a lot of measures were taking uh, were taken in, in a quite a rapid succession. So first came, uh, so this, um, the color gives you which type of measure this is. So here in, in, in pink, you have the social distancing measures and then first the mass gatherings cancellations, then schools were closed, then small gathering cancellations. And here the last measures that were basically taken were then the lockdown measures. The size of the circles here already encodes the average effectiveness of these measures that we get and I'm, I'm going to tell you now more about what we what we found on that. So um, here is here is now this effectiveness ranking that we get out of these four methods. So for each of the four methods that you see described here, we get uh, we get basically a score that tells us whether this measure is effective or not in this given method. And then we look at those. First, we look at those uh, measures that showed a, a statistically significant effect. In each of the in each of the four models, what you then come, find coming up out on top of this list are small gathering cancellations. So basically, here um, if you look at the subcategories of this category, then it's home office uh, uh, closing of, of of restaurants, of bars, of shops, and and all these kind of things. Second most effective measure: uh, the closure of educational institution. And um, then also amongst this consensus set of measures where we find uh, a significant uh, um, effect in all of the, of the measures, we found border restrictions, individual movement restrictions, also the lockdown, and of course, measures to ramp up the capacity in the healthcare system, uh, like increasing the availability of PPEs and so forth. Then we have a set of measures that are um, statistically significant in three out of the four measures. And there then, for instance, you also find um, next to the social distancing and movement restriction measures, you also find risk communication measures and basically governmental assistance for, for medically and economically vulnerable populations. And uh, particularly uh, what I'd like to emphasize here are these risk communication activities. So this we categorized into two different um, activities, namely those where you target the public and those where you target specific stakeholders. And both of them basically were showed then um, uh, yeah, showed some, some effects. Uh, so let's let's dive a bit deeper into, into these findings. And the first thing that I want to tell you, so what we showed here is basically an, an average or um, 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 yeah, an average, so to say, of, of the measure effectiveness is over all different countries. However, this effectiveness um, really depends heavily on the context of the measure in which you put it. So for instance, here uh, we show um, how effectiveness varies as a function of the epidemic age at which you adopt, at which you take this measure. So um, here we compare uh, when did the countries apply these measures uh, and how much was then the reduction, the reproduction number that we observed for uh, three different measures, uh, small gathering cancellations, airward restrictions, closures of educational institutions. 
and basically uh, what you see is then that the earlier the, uh, the measure you take, the more strong is the, is the reduction of the R of T. The longer you wait, the, 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 um, you, see, you see less of this effect. Uh, here on the right hand side of the panel, we showed two different measures that have an opposite uh, functional shape. So uh, if you, this is the activate case notification and tracing and tracking. So here countries that implement these measures very early, so that, that we are, um, yeah, so they basically had an, uh, an, an, an effect of increasing the R of T. And then for those countries that implemented this later on, they are, then you see some, some, some increases. So this, this curve, of course, it can now explain this by, um, uh, yeah, if you, for instance, particularly the tracing and tracking um, 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 measures. So if you, if you start to uh, implement them, then at first, of course, you're gonna find uh, more cases. And also it tells you something about how well these countries were prepared. Anyhow, uh, what the thing that I want to emphasize here is timing of these measures really really matters. Uh, but there's much more context that matters here uh, without going into too much details of that. We are, we are correlating this, these measures with different socioeconomic, cultural policy indicators of the different countries. So in particular, we look at, at population, population density. We look at how many other uh, uh, NPIs have already been implemented, how many other um, NPIs that are in a similar category have been implemented, uh, GDP of the countries, human development uh, index and several policy indicators. And as you see this, this, this um, uh, you get all, um, yeah, they, they all have effects that go in one direction or into another, you could go then into, uh, into more data here and basically what you find here are for instance that this tracing and tracking measures that they are more effective in high GDP countries countries with low accountability in governance. So these are results that are driven by some Southeastern Asian countries, like for instance, Singapore. However, you also find that these NPIs that increase healthcare capacity, that they basically are, in, uh, are cor correlate with a high control of corruption, regulatory quality. So you really see an effect that, that countries that have a high level of government effectiveness, regulatory quality, that they manage to increase the healthcare capacity as much uh, much more efficiently than other countries. Um, okay, so that's that's one point that I want to bring across. So for each of these this, for each of these measures, uh, context matters. And now let's let me discuss uh, the results a bit more in detail for some of the individual measures that that may be uh, more or less surprising. So first question: This is a question people very often ask. So how effective was the lockdown? What we find in this work is that overall lockdowns defined as stay at home orders, they show a significant effect, but this effect is of a rather moderate size. How can you understand this? Well, uh, be aware that there is no such a thing as a lockdown by itself. A lockdown in practice is always a bundle of NPIs. And this bundle, if you make a stay at home, or home order, you basically compare, a, uh, combine a curfew uh, with uh, school closure, closure of public places, small gathering cancellations and so forth. I've shown you at the beginning of the time series of how countries pro progressed. And in almost all cases, countries took a lockdown when they already had some uh, measures in place. So what you, do in this, what you find in this databases, if you measure the effectiveness of the lockdown is that the, the lockdown is basically the delta that you have between having say three to four social distancing measures in place combined to having five social distancing measures in place. And there the, the finding is that if you suitably combine this a smaller package of NPIs, you don't go for a full lockdown, but better with a better sequence and timing and particularly with, an, with early acting, then our modeling, the, the results of this model suggest that you can substitute the, the a lockdown in terms of effectiveness uh, by a smaller package of measures. I mean, this shouldn't be, um, come too much as a surprise that the, 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 the Sweden and, and Finland debate all over, if you're familiar with that. And of course, there's been also this controversial paper by Ioannidis, who is basically claiming that because they find some, some, some similar results in their data, that, uh, that this more stringent NPIs are not, um, 
are not more effective than less stringent NPIs. I personally um, yeah, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't subscribe to this interpretation of these results. What we really see is that particularly in the first wave, many of the lockdowns that countries took, they were overpowered. And, but that doesn't mean that this, um, with, the, with the pandemic policy fatigue that we have, that these measures wouldn't be uh, required or necessary today. But yeah, now I'm, I'm going already on a tangent. So we found as the second most effective measures, cool closures. We tried to get this first published this paper in May, June last year. And back then it was still the majority opinion that um, schools don't really contribute to the virus spread. So we had a hard time of getting this, this thing published because referees were saying there has to be an error. It's known that, that schools don't really um, contribute to, to that. So you, I think you're all aware of the, of the controversy around this, this issue still um, till, um, until now. I keep the, the discussion here short because there will be a part of this, of this lecture where I go into details in schools. And, um, but basically what we find here is that um, schools have a significant effect. This, the effect appears to be larger if we look at uh, for, for students aged 12 to 18 years, but we also have statistically, so we also see some results for kindergartens and primary schools, but these are statistically less robust. Good. So these are, these are, is the, with that, I wanna, wanna, wanna close this of, of um, this chapter of evaluating the NPIs on a, on a global level. And uh, if, you, if you want to know any more of these results, please ask me after, after the talk. I think there is, is, is plenty still to be said about this, but in the, in the interest of time, let me tell you about the modeling work that we're doing for, for, for Austria. So, um, we are, we are one third of the so-called COVID Workers Consortium where we basically are three different research institutes operating three different epidemiological models. And we do this to forecast hospital utilization uh, via the, basically we, we make a forecast for the case numbers. And from that we forecast uh, the number, the bed occupancies in ICUs and normal wards that we expect. The models themselves, they are all calibrated using the same data from the official Austrian reporting systems, but otherwise they're independent from each other. And I will show you uh, how we compare this, how we combine these models and why it really doesn't matter how exactly you combine this. Um, so what we do, and this is crucial to note, is we do short-term forecasts, meaning we have, had, have used over the past year short-term forecasts ranging between eight and 14 days. We do this because we don't believe that using epidemiological models for longer term forecasting is a serious scientific business. Uh, here is, I think, the, the, the paper that explains this nice, most nicest. It's a, it's a PNAS from, from the group of Susanna Manorubia. And there they tried to ask if you can, if you take, um, if you, if you take um, uh, simulated epidemics, and actually they happen to use um, um, a compartmental model that is quite similar in structure to the model that we are using for the forecast to show that if you then take the data that this model generates and try to predict turning points of an epidemic, uh, given that, that measures are taken from this computer model, then you are not really able to predict the computer model. So this is what they, what they show here in, in, in what is shown in this plot, the, the yeah, credible intervals that basically that they get uh, by trying to forecast the simulated epidemics. Here is the same exercise for forecasting a, a real epidemics. And the thing becomes clearer if you look at it, not on log scale, but on mean scale, as is, as is shown here, that basically after a couple of days, this forecast become completely irrelevant. So um, that was a hard job at the beginning of the pandemics to make all the, to, to make the policy makers aware that there long-term forecasts and epidemiological models are not possible. Models are much too sensitive uh, to, 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 to everything that you can think of um, to allow this. So that's why uh, after some fighting, we convinced them that we only do this if we do short-term forecasts, and this is how we do them. So I, I told you three models. Uh, this is the first model. It's the, the, the model that, that we operate. And basically, it's an extended SIRX model. So the SIRX model, this was one of the earliest 
model inclu including NPIs, which was uh, which came out from from Dirk Brockman, who is at the Robert Koch Institute in Germany. And basically, the idea is you have, you start with the typical uh, SIR algebra, and then you introduce a compartment for quarantined individuals for, for susceptible quarantined individuals and for infected quarantined individuals. So this basically quantifies the social distancing, the, the flows between these two compartments. And this here is basically the efficiency of your test trace isolate strategy. Here you see this in, in, in um, uh, put into, into, into different, uh, differential equations, but basically it's, it's uh, one of the more parsimonious models that you can write down and here the, the idea behind using these models was really to have a parsimonious model that is as easy as, to, as e that is uh, easy to calibrate therefore. So this is this is one of the models. The other model operated by a group from the Technical University of Vienna um, is an is an agent based model where they have um, basically did a one to one mapping of the Austrian population on an epidemiological SEIR model so that um, uh, a model that this also has an exposed phase. And um, they try to model the, the contact networks as close as possible. So each individual is assigned to a workplace or a school and to a household. And they are depending on this different type of context. You have different, um, you have different um, transmission probabilities and so forth. Um, also not going into details here. You can check it out in the, in the from, from the colleagues in the, uh, yeah, in the references given here. And the third model that is operated by the Austrian Institute, by the Austrian Public Health Institute, this is uh, basically a Markov model of, the, of, the, uh, of, of an SIR type uh, where they, yes, um, yeah, which is also similar in structure to this SIR model, the difference being that it, it's basically a state space model where you also have the, the yeah, more or less typical sequences of having of importing cases uh, or having having some effected that then undergo the, the time dynamics of, of, of being presymptomatic, detected or undetected, and then you have some isolation policies and 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 they recover. And so for this model, they basically use the calibrate. They have formulated a model like this because the area can measure most of the parameters. Of course, say for the undetected cases based on the, on the uh, contact tracing data that the Austrian agencies provide. Good. Now some um, challenges that, you, that, you, that we have in calibrating this model. So we are doing weekly forecasts. For each week, we produce a new short-term forecast for eight to 14 days. That means when we have our prognosis day, um, and, and actually we had one of them today, we first have to estimate how much cases will be uh, uh, will be um, yeah uh, still reported for today uh, that come with a reporting delay. And here you can see the, the scope of the problem that, um, that we have. So, so for instance, this was for one case where we needed to make a prediction here. And then you see that after we made the prediction, so the, 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 the number of, of cases that were, came late in reporting. So um, before we can feed these models, before we can calibrate this model, uh, we, we need to basically make an, an assumption or make guesses based on past uh, reporting delays, how much we believe that the current infection numbers underrepresent the actual caseload. Um, and so this is one thing, this is this now casting exercise that is crucial um, to do a, a accurate short-term forecasts. And the other thing is uh, here are different regions of Austria and here you see the weekday effect. So sorry here that everything is in German, but I think the message is, 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 is hopefully clear anyhow. So here we try to find for each region, what is the weekday pattern? Each region, they have their own agency and these agencies have different rhythms in reporting the cases. So you need to also, since sometimes we need to make a forecast on Tuesdays and sometimes we need to make it on Friday, we have to do the now casting also as a function of the weekday uh, at which we are doing it because this then means that there are different structures in the reporting delays that we need to put into the model. So good. Um, that being said, um, how good does did this um, now really work the kind of models that we make? So let me walk you through the, through the plots and there we try to tell the story. So here you fi we find that the actual Austrian epicurve. 
So the, the incidents, the daily new confirmed cases. So it is, we had a small peak now uh, in, in the standards by, by uh, in April. Uh, we didn't do the forecasts in March, we only started to doing to publishing them in, in April, better to say. And th this was the wave that we had in, in autumn. You see here uh, the time series of the effective reproduction number. Here you see the forecast from our, from our three models and the harmonized forecast. So for the first weeks, you basically see that we were, um, we were systematically under, um, um, so, uh, underestimating the actual developments. And then after some, after some yeah, uh, weeks, we then uh, man, found out how to do this basically and then converged and had here phases of, of, of a better accuracy. And then what happened here, here is that um, uh, here we had very low case numbers in Austria, but then all the people came back from holidays. And uh, this, um, in particular, there was, there, there was a cluster of a tennis tournament in, in one of the neighboring countries in Austria, where um, the, the discotheques were open and everything. And, this, and then we had imports of a lot of cases from this tennis tournament happening in a neighboring country. And since we, so we didn't anticipate this import uh, risk properly, then we had here a poor forecast and rebounded from that. And then what happened here is that here the second wave really took off. You see this in the, in the rise of the reproduction number that was now at lower case, at higher case numbers. And in particular here, we had a really jump in the, in the effective reproduction number that we really didn't anticipate. You see it. Um, you see our forecast for the cumulative time series you see here. And basically this yellow forecast, this was one of the important ones because this was one of the forecasts that we made uh, expecting basically an R effective that is in this regime, but then having a jump. And why this jump was, was crucial, um, I'm, I'm gonna tell you uh, <laughs> in a minute first. Um, so how, uh, here's an evaluation of our forecast accuracy that you know how this, how this confidence intervals that we show here come about. Basically after some weeks, we had enough data that we can constantly evaluate our empirical forecast error. And basically we found that, that the, the ratio of predicted to observed cases that you can approximate this re, uh, reasonably by a log normal distribution. And so we parameterized it like that. And basically, so the, the confidence intervals that you see here, these are derived from assuming that our empirical forecast errors are log normal distributed and then fitting this log normal distributions to our past accuracy. So here we had a highly inaccurate forecast and this um, blow up our, our confidence intervals for, for, for some time coming. And um, yes, here you see the, our predictions for the ICU bed occupancy. So how do we do this? So we predict the case numbers based on these three different models. And then based on that, we assume that they, uh, we take from the, from the Austrian data, uh, the hospitalization rates and how long it takes in order to be admitted to an ICU. Um, so for this, there's no reliable data where you can do this. And, and then um, what happened here uh, after this one forecast where we, where we uh, didn't anticipate the growth is that so this red line, this is the critical line for Austria, because this is the point that, um, that the, that the um, intensive care specialists define as the point where you, uh, where they can't, where they are not able anymore to, 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 to basically provide all the patients at the ICUs with an optimal level of care. So this is the, if you're talking Austria about overloading the ICUs, then this red line is what we have in, in mind. And what happened here is that um, after we had this jump, we had in within our confidence intervals that we're gonna, gonna basically pulverize this boundary. And, and this um, yeah, uh, was now really a, a point that, that we needed to make clear to the politicians that uh, at this level, even though uh, this increase that happened here was, was at case numbers that are uh, was when their perception really, really low that we had this dynamics, this acceleration in the dynamics. That means that we, that we uh, were really starting to hit the boundary. And this was then basically what then led two weeks afterwards to, to um, a hard lockdown in, in, in Austria. 
So uh, as I told you, we do these reports weekly basis. And here is, is just to, to, to offer you a glimpse behind the scenes of the reporting template that we, that we use. So here are now the incidences. And basically, we, this is the seven day uh, incidents. And here we send out this, um, this sheet each day. And here is the, the prediction for the case numbers. And then the, the green dots here are each day, we add a dot and check how close our forecast is to the actual developments. And the same ha is happening for the ICU wards. This is in here, here's the red line. This is where we are currently are in Austria. And for the normal wards, here's basically, here's by the way, they the, the, the are effective. And um, what happened last week is last week was the first time that for some of the areas in Austria, we had it again that in the, in the 68% confidence interval of the ICU forecast, we were hitting this red line. So this is now, we are now again in a, in a very critical situation in Austria because of that. And it's because of the rise of B117. And, and so right now the decisions are to counter this with regional measures for high incidence regions. But what's, what's behind this is, um, or what is, what is contributing to these decisions is, is really, so how close are they to hitting this, this red line here? Okay, so so much for the for the forecasts, and um, now uh, I want to show you some of our work to model the spread of SARS-CoV-2 in specific settings. The first setting that I'm going to talk about is in in schools. So, what is the the story behind that? Um, so, we had uh, schools in Austria open in September and October. Then they were basically closed uh, when when this development here happened. Then the school stayed closed until February, January, uh, until, um, until, uh, until February 2021. 20, uh, and then the, the pressure just came too big that to allow them to stay closed. And um, then the question was, how can we safely reopen them? And um, this was uh, some of the work that we, that we did in order to, to answer this question, whether this is possible to, to, to think about safely reopening schools in Austria in a, in a sustainable way. And this is a collaboration between uh, our institute and the, the agency that is, is um, responsible for contact tracing in Austria. And they, uh, with them together, we analyzed the um, transmissions on, um, so to, uh, data on contact tracing data on transmissions in school settings and used this to calibrate an agent-based epidemiological model. And this, this model, the formula for different school types in a, in a way that I will show you in a, in a minute. What we try to do here is again, to quantify the effectiveness of different non-pharmaceutical interventions. But now these are interventions that are, um, that, that are feasible in schools. So particularly we talk about ventilation, about use of masks, class size reductions, and screen, antigen screening tests. So these are this, this lateral flow tests. And particularly we are looking here at the Ontario Nassar tests. So these are the tests where you take the swab from the from the from the front of your nose, and um, yes, of course, this is also an, an uh, important point. Now we also wanted to know how do all these results change for more transmissible variants, since this is an issue that we now have to to really fight with. And uh, we build an interactive simulation tool, and this we did after interacting with a lot of the teachers and, and people in, in, in the education ministry, because they, they require tools with, that they can use to communicate uh, why some of these NPIs are needed to teach the students and, and particularly the parents of the students. Okay, let me, let me briefly show you how the contact tracing data looks like. So all in all, and this was, this was taken in, the, in this time period in September and October in Austria when schools were open, we had the 606 infection clusters. And um, these infection clusters had 9,200 cases in total, out of which there were 2,800 students and 676 teachers. Um, to some extent, it was possible to map these clusters to the type of schools. So here you see, for instance, primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, secondary schools and schools that we couldn't map. And here you see what was the index case. So the first recorded case in the, in the cluster. And then you see uh, in primary cares, almost all the index cases are teachers. And then the balance shifts towards, uh, towards students being index, index cases if you look at, at upper secondary schools. 
Um, here you see the, the breakdown of how many cases have been identified uh, in, in total across the different school types. And there you also see that the, um, um, for upper secondary uh, schools, there are much more students than, than, than um, in the, that compose the clusters compared to primary schools. However, um, this is the ratio of asymptomatic cases. And there you clearly see that the likelihood to have an asymptomatic uh, course of, the, of, of, of a SARS-CoV-2 infection is much higher, is much lower in the, uh, for, uh, amongst younger uh, students. So um, about 70% for children under the age of six, whereas for the 15 to 18 years old, you have a chance of, of maybe 40% of asymptomatic cases. And this of course confounds what you see here that um, because of course, uh, teachers are more likely to be the index case. It's simply because they are more likely asymptomatic, more likely to get tested. And therefore they then constitute in the contact tracing data, the index case. And, and these kind of biases, we somehow try to uh, yeah, calibrate the model property in, properly in order to get these biases out. Uh, Peter, for last page, uh, asymptomatic cases, is this is from the assumptions or this is from the antigen? This test? is the data. And is there the I have to add, this is, this is the data at the time where they, where they interviewed the case. So it might be that we have very few cases here, you know, who did do this contact tracing thing and then they developed symptoms later on. But, oh, oh, but overall, I mean, it's also very, very consistent with the other literature being there out that of course you have this very steep age gradient in the, in, the, in, the, in the symptomatic disease courses. And this is, this is the dominant age effect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, here are, the, here are the, the sizes of these clusters um, for, for, different, for different school settings. And there uh, you see this very skewed distribution where, where most of the clusters are small. But then of course you have, you also find 3% um, uh, of clusters that have more than 20 cases. And uh, yeah, but 40%, 60% are only one case in the school. So this is the, also the typical over this first uh, pattern um, that we see here. So here are some, some, some details on, on how the model looks like. Uh, it's um, basically adapted from a model that we developed for prevention strategies in nursing homes. I'm gonna just show you at the end very, very briefly uh, what we did there. And the, what the model tries to do is to connect the in-host viral dynamics to the population dynamics. So basically for each agent, we try to model this year. What, what is this here? This is the viral load as a function of time since exposure. So agents start in a susceptible state, then they become exposed to the virus. There's an exposure duration. After this, they become infectious. Uh, we have symptomatic and asymptomatic courses. Then you recover. At each of this time point, you can get uh, quarantine or isolated. These are the states X. Um, what is this here? This is how we basically parameterize the viral load. So we have here um, a threshold for, for becoming infectious, meaning that if your viral load gets above this threshold, you go from the exposed to the infectious phase. This is important because you're meddling test strategies here. And what um, uh, yeah, what the literature suggests is that if you use this, this antigen test, so this lateral flow devices, they are able to discover, to detect you about here, one to two days after crossing this detectability threshold, or this infectiousness threshold. Whereas PCR tests, uh, for example, they detect you, start to be, are, are able to detect you around here. So, so on top of this, we also have this, the, the, this logic of whether at the current viral load a, a given test is able to detect you or not. And um, yeah, in the model, these things are also not fixed, but, but we do the, uh, yeah, the, the sample is from distributions. And um, we, there is some extensive calibration going on there, and, uh, which I'm also not going into detail, but basically we try to take as much, in, uh, as much values as possible out of the literature. What the consequences of this, I'm gonna tell you, tell you shortly. And we end up basically with calibrating uh, just the, the transmission risk, how, how much we have to discount this compared to the household transmission risks for different types of contacts. So for just having 
having intensive contact or just, are just are being moderately exposed and so forth. Uh, if we go through all this and we, we, we also allow for an age dependence, um, what we basically find is that um, six year old persons are 25% less likely to participate in a transmission than 18 years old. So despite having here this huge differences between students and teachers in terms of how they how likely they are index cases. If you factor in this, this testing strategies, this, the, the fact that you only start to test when people develop symptoms and the fact that at these younger ages, students are much less uh, symptomatic, what survives basically is a 25% change in, in how likely you, you are to, to transmit the virus, which compared to many other effects we have in the model is rather, uh, rather modest. And it really, if you want to understand the spread in schools, and this is one of my main points here, you shouldn't think about age. Age is, we believe, not the driver. I tell you what we believe that one of the main drivers is. What we model are school type specific contact networks. And this uh, we basically took from the statistics of how the typical Austrian school of, for a given school type looks like. So this is a primary school. You have here the teachers, these are the blue circles, and they teach basically most of the time a class. This is the class here. The class, the, the students have their, have the household members and then there are some parents have, have multiple children in different classes. So here the household acts as a bridge between two different classes. Um, yes, and here, this is the typical Austrian primary schools. It has one, two, three, it has eight classes, number of teachers. And, and of course, then you have this dense contact network within the classes. This is how the typical Austrian secondary school looks like. You have teachers that go to a different classroom in each hour of the day. That has the, the schools themselves, they are much larger and you have much more mixing going on there. And this mixing is facilitated by the teachers that, that connect the clusters of the, or this, this, this social network clusters of different schools. And we believe that this is the huge structural difference is, if you, if you try to understand how SARS-CoV-2 spreads in schools, it's really the structure of these context networks. They're completely different if you look at primary and secondary schools. Okay, so here is a glimpse at the simulation tool. Feel free to check it out. And there is also some, some, some more detail on how calibration uh, uh, worked and, and uh, the assumptions in the model that you can look at at this website. And I hope that we have the preprint on this thing uh, uh, ready in in, uh, in in a couple of days. So here are the results that we get from the simulation. What we're looking here is, we're looking here at the infectedness, at the outbreak sizes that we get for, if we, if we just turn on one of the intervention measures at a time in the simulation. So here, first row is we have only, only test trace isolate. And then you basically get in all school types, a bimodal distribution. Blue here are clusters that have, has an index case, the teacher, Red are index cases students. Bimodal meaning means in some cases you detect the case early, then you have, then the cluster gets contained very quickly. If this doesn't work, then uh, basically the, this, this permeates through the school. So this gives you this bimodal shape. Then we do different testing strategies, testing once or twice students or teachers wearing masks during the, um, during the lessons. Uh, halving the class size and ventilating. And without going into too much details, what you see is that ventilation is by far the most effective uh, uh, NPI that we consider here, uh, substantially more um, effective than this antigen testing and also the, the class size reductions. What you also see that in general is that this index, uh, in many school types, this index uh, case teacher clusters, in particular in secondary and upper secondary schools, they um, uh, yeah, uh, tend, to be, tend to be larger, meaning that you have less, um, yeah, um, you have for the, for the index case students, you have less, more smaller clusters. And this now, of course, ties in with what I told you before in, 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 in how the, the contact networks are different in this, um, in, across the school types. So here are the results if we combine NPIs and there, we, we try, okay, if we start with test trace isolate, then we ask them to ventilate, 
plus wearing masks for teachers and students and class size uh, reductions. And there you see how the outbreak size is reduced. So um, without going into too much details here, basically what this again shows is that in order to contain SARS-CoV-2 on schools, what you need to do is a combination of measures. You can again go for different combinations of measures. You can go for class size reductions and, and, and mask, masks, or you can leave away the class size reduction and be much more um, um, aggressive with the testing. Both are viable strategies and this you need to tailor to the specific school type, to the specific context. This, this is a, an important point that I want to convey sensitivity. So we did, uh, we did two um, main analysis of sensitivity. First is where we assume a mutant that is 50% more transmissible than the variant which we used to calibrate everything, which was the, uh, yeah, so before B117 and everything happened. And then what we did is, did is that we take the conservative estimates for each measure that we could find in the literature. So for one, we thought so, uh, we, we tried to find out so what is the, the value for the effectiveness of say wearing cloth masks that the literature most agrees on. And now what are the, if we go on the conservative end of these estimates, what do we find? Here we show how much the, how the factor by which the outbreak sizes increase. So for the mutant, the, this goes uh, up to having three times, as much, three times larger outbreaks depending on school type and measure. Um, this is, if we go to this conservative scenario, yeah, we can have 30 times higher outbreaks. Here you see the same for how the, the reproduction number uh, develops in these different scenarios. And then you can have up to seven times higher reproduction numbers if we go under this conservative esti uh, estimates. So this means really, uh, and this is also clear, outbreak sizes scale exponentially with uh, uh, the effectiveness of individual measures and really so that the difference between a poorly executed and a well executed prevention strategy is really is orders of magnitude. Okay, so here are the conclusions to this part. Um, yeah, so for primary school, basically the bottom line is that uh, with ventilation and weekly antigen screening, you can, you should be able to, to minimize clusters uh, um, but you will still have some clusters occurring with more than five five persons and you need to adjust this basically to the incidence. If you want to go to achieve a similar level of protection, then particularly for, for secondary schools, you need to combine this additionally with wearing masks or, or, or other, other measures. But let, let me stress here the high sensitivity of the results that we have here. Okay, and now I think the time is almost up. So, but uh, just one slide on, on nursing homes. And they are basically, we did the same, but we there you really need to go for PCR tests and um, this was actually a testing strategy that was then really implemented in some nursing homes where they managed to build up an infrastructure to do the same day PCR tests. And, and this managed to contain COVID in those, in those nursing homes that adapted this, this testing strategies quite reasonably well. Uh, yes, I think, uh, yeah, but with this, let me, let me come to, uh, to, my, to the overall conclusions. I think it doesn't matter at the, the setting we look at, Key point is there is no single measure alone that is enough to control the spread of SARS-CoV-2. If there would be the silver bullet that solves everything, the, the, the world wouldn't be in this, uh, in this shitty situation that we are. So whenever you, you evaluate uh, uh, NPIs, in the independent of the setting, you always need to think in terms of smart combinations of these measures that you can realize in a specific setting or a specific country. And then also let me, uh, I think, uh, I hopefully I also tried to show you how limited these epidemiological models are. They are highly sensitive to all the assumptions that you make. And uh, so I think they can be used that you provide a ranking of, of, of something given this, the sensitivities, but, but really be careful in drawing too strong conclusions on this kind of models. Yes, uh, we've been also part of an, an initiative calling for some more European coordinated defenses against SARS-CoV-2 and have two opinion pieces in the Lancet out of that. So please check this out in, if you're interested in how we believe that Europe should better approach the crisis in the, in the upcoming weeks and months. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. So um, we are 
now time have time for questions. Anyone want to raise questions? You can raise a hand or send a comment to Tom. Tom, Tom's hurt. You you can you can raise question directly, Tom. Oops. Hi. Um. Thank you, Peter. Uh. Very. Um. Very uh, impressive talk. I learned a lot from it. Um. Just a, a question about how you think of. Um, combining um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So the Swiss cheese model that you're looking at there on this slide, right? Um, but do you kind of, you have to worry about whether the, these measures can be treated as independent or not. I wonder what your thoughts are about this. Yes. So, um, there, so we have some of the models, I think, where we where we can understand a little bit about how this, this individual measures interact. However, we found that that um, again the context matters, and maybe we have uh, then a model that works good for one country. So if you're now talking about country level, but it completely fails or breaks down if you try to transport it to a different model uh, to a different country. So at the end of the day, um, I can't really give a fully satisfying answer to that. However, what, they can, what, 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 what uh, we are trying to do in order to solve this, and particularly answer this for the second wave, to make countries comparable in the terms of the NPIs that you had, is that you, you really need to properly choose the countries that you, that you compare with each other. And you can't, what we learned, I think, from all this is that this logic that you say, okay, country X managed to do without measure Y, so we, country Z, should also be able to abandon this measure. This is a logic that doesn't work. And what, what we find is, um, and, and this, these are now some more speculative results, we haven't published anything out of that, but as your question uh, was going in this direction, first there was this assumption that as a country, if you're not stringent enough with your measures, then you have a higher growth of cases and then you need to become more stringent in order to get it down again. So this is the hypothesis that you need to fine tune uh, the, your measures to the sweet point where you can control the spread. I think the, the data doesn't support this hypothesis. What we observe if we compare countries is that some countries manage to, to get more stringent through all of the pandemics and some less stringent, and these countries can be uh, 500 kilometers apart from each other, so very close. And the, so um, the, the, the dissatisfying answer to your question is I think there is no general answer to that. If you look at a specific country and want to find out what worked and what not, you need to construct a suitable control set of countries that have similar socioeconomic, cultural, demographic preconditions that had a somewhat similar um, spread in terms of exposure that they, uh, so for this geographic distribution of variants and so forth, and only then you can make controlled comparison. And everything okay. else that I'm seeing, I wouldn't believe. Um, just, just to um, sharpen my question a little bit, I mean, in the Swiss cheese model, you've got sort of preventive, see this slide that I'm looking at, preventative yeah. measures and virus screening. I mean, if you just assumed a 50% reduction on any one single measure, would the three together be just a half of a half of a half? Uh, thank you. Is thank that? You. Yeah, I mean, of course, for the, yes. I mean, that's the, so that's basically the, I think this, this plot here, there we do exactly what you said. So we take each of these layers and take the conservative estimate for this layer. And then you see here, we have this, this combinations where we, where we stack the, 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 the measures on top of that. And still for what we get particularly for, for, uh, for, for um, this, this upper secondary schools here is that even if we are, you know, in a regime where we have half class sizes, where we test everyone twice a week, we still have in secondary schools, or upper secondary schools, 20 to 30 times increased outbreak sizes. And this, this effect is much larger than, for instance, if you look at specific uh, variants and make the variant 50% more transmissible or not, or if you take this age story and and children are 25% less transmissible, this all really doesn't matter. It's about if you fully execute the strategy as a whole or not. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Thomas. Last question is from Andreas uh, Schreiker. Andre, do you want to raise a question directly? 
uh, yes, thank you. Um, basically, the question is, um, when you model, of course, the effect of the measures in epidemiological models, you model it excellently. It was a great article to listen. But to what extent are you, um, in general, the effectiveness of measures in say, statistics, also econometrics, is modeled causally? And to what extent, in general, also in your models, can this be interpreted as direct effect of the measure? One would yes, say the net effect. That's, that's an excellent question. So I, I mean, I, I, I leave aside here this agent-based mechanistic models because I, I think there it's, it's, it's clear how to answer these questions. Of course, the question is more relevant for the statistical analysis that we do. And as I said before, before I think there is a lot of reverse causality that is tainting the debate about this measure effectiveness. And so to bring it to the point, so what, what is it? If you have high case numbers, do you need more stringent uh, measures? Or do countries that employ most recent measures just have, for whatever reason, higher case numbers? And per, I mean, I can't give you a scientific proof of that, so it's my personal belief. After working for one year with this data and doing these comparisons, uh, so I think there are some confounding factors that we can't control that we that we don't know yet. And and um, okay. well, it could be interpersonal trust. There is a nice preprint from coming out of Oxford recently. Where they propose that it's it's interpersonal trust as as one of these confounding factors. So if you are your neighbors, if you have the feeling that your neighbors more willingly adhere to the measures, then you're also willing to do so by yourself. Uh, that could be one explanation. Today I've seen a, a paper in PNAS where they attributed it to points. So I, I don't know, but I, I wouldn't rule out any of these environmental or social factors by themselves and for exactly this reason. We can't answer this causality question. But is it possible? I just continue very shortly and end. I think when you showed the models, there was some Bayesian network, if I saw a correctly, a graphical model, one of the models. Uh, would it be possible to include this in causal manner, even if you would include, say, all the um, confounders and other variables with the modeling that is here? Um, so uh, what, I've, what I've shown you was, was, was not a, a probabilistic graphical model, but it was, a, it was okay. basically a, a correlation network at the end of the day. Uh, okay. uh, honestly, I haven't, I haven't seen, so I, uh, now I have, so there, there were some, I, I've seen one paper where they tried to do a causal model for wearing face masks in exactly the, I think, in what, the way that you have in mind for, for, the, for, the, for New York. And, but we haven't done anything like that. So there are such approaches out there, but we haven't perceived them. Okay. And okay. so I, I can't really tell you, so I have, have not worked with them. I can't really tell you what, uh, what are the pros and cons uh, of Great. adopting these kind yes. of things, yeah. Okay, thank you, thanks. Great, um, time is up. So I would like to again, on behalf of the Fields Institute, on behalf of the COVID-19 uh, Rapid Response Task Force uh, in the country, I uh, would like to thank uh, Professor Klemek again for uh, bringing us your experience from Austria, but it's really with methodology that's universally applied. Um, thank you very much for coming and uh, we are looking forward to all the opportunities to, to bring your expertise, uh, Peter. So thank you all again. Thanks a lot for having me again. Have a nice day ahead of you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, great lecture.